My name is John Massari, and I'm the composer for Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which I'm very proud of, of having been one of my films that I've composed music for. How I came to meet the Kyoto Brothers, uh, a, friend, a good friend of mine in Washington, D.C., by the name of Eric Young, told me that his good, his good friends were working on a movie that was unlike anything that was being made at the time. Uh, this was 1987, the summer of 1987. Uh, he gave me Steve's phone number. I called him up, and uh, he basically invited me to a screening in which, unbeknownst to me, were 30 or 40 other film composers. Uh, as I was watching the movie, I had turned over uh, to... Now, the movie had no temp music, by the way. It was just clear, flat. Um, we were just watching the movie on its own with minimal uh, uh, visual effects. And at one point, I turned over to the person sitting next to me, and I said, you know, since I was a kid, clowns have scared the you-know-what out of me. And uh, the guy turned uh, over to me and said, yeah, me too. Yeah. And I found out that later on, that person was Steve Kyoto. I was sitting next to the director. Anyways, we did a blind demo. Um, the, uh, most of the composers, uh, including myself, uh, took a video uh, back home, picked a scene that was important to them, and uh, composed music to it. My scene that I composed music to, that I, as the demo to get the movie, was the scene where the clowns were chasing the kids out of the spaceship, and all of a sudden they mold a, uh, a a balloon dog. They kind of sculpt it, and the dog comes to life, and they chase after. And I just completely honed in on that. I said, "That's it. This is my picture. I know I got based on my uh, inspiration for that particular uh, scene. I got it, and I got the call a few days later. He says, "You got the you got the job." Balonga. So then, uh, after that, uh, I met with both Ke all, all three Kyoto brothers, and we discussed the type of music they want. They said that we want nothing that is that was done before. Everything's got to be almost done backwards. You know, if you're gonna, if the scene's got to be with uh, uh, done with strings, do it with percussion. If it's if it's something that should be uh, sustained, uh, just jab and just completely do it differently. So that's what I did for three weeks. I worked by myself. Uh, all three Kyoto brothers were uh, very busy doing the important aspects of, uh, of post-production of the film, and uh, there would be times where I would be recording the score, where uh, I would ask the guys to come in to, to see something, and they said, John, we like the direction you're going to. Right now, you're the least of our problems. I, we can't even tell you what we're doing right now. And to this day, I kind of don't know what they were doing, but I'm sure it was very important. Um, and it's, I believe it's very important to uh, um, acknowledge the fact that the scoring of the first uh, cue of the score was done on Halloween. <laughs> October 31st, 1987. And so that made it more special because after I was done recording that day, oh, it was about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, I went to a uh, Halloween party in Hollywood, in the center of Hollywood, which is where I lived at the time, which is where I still live. Um, and I told people that I'm working on this movie that is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's about clowns, it's science fiction. It brings back all the memories of me when I was a kid watching sci-fi movies uh, in a theater, and it's just such a great experience. And when I told them the basic outline of the movie, I thought I was out of my mind. I said, no, one, no one's gonna understand what this movie's about. We don't, there were people that got it and those that didn't. And I found, I found the people that got it are really nice people. People that get this movie are really nice people. That's what it comes down to. People that don't get it, I think, have issues. I hate to use that word, but I think they have things that they have to settle in their life. And when they get that settled and they view Killer Clowns from Outer Space again, the child in them will come alive again and they will be right with the world. <laughs> after Killer Clowns from Outer Space, after that score, I was ostracized. 
However, I, I, certain aspects, uh, aspects of the industry did ostracize me. However, three months after I scored Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I did the theme for the wonderful world of Disney. So I went from one extreme to another. And uh, so, it, to be honest with you, it, it, uh, it did great things for me. <laughs> and there are certain old school aspects of the score that I think we wanted. We wanted certain things to sound like it was old 50s type of music done with just uh, you know you know bongos and vibraphones you know because in the day that was in those days that's all they had budgets for so we didn't want to like over polish it and at certain times we wanted to you know make it sort of elegant in a, in a, in a way uh, the most elegant scene for me uh, was uh, was when they when they stepped into the big reactor room they were in this little tent that they thought was a little tent and all of a sudden there's like this fourth dimension there's this huge reactor that goes up to infinity and down to infinity and uh, I had written a piece of music a year before uh, after I went to uh, I was in Paris I was in the Notre Dame Cathedral and I sketched out this little tiny theme which I used in, the, in that scene I thought this would be great for someone that walks in a huge cavern or something like that and that and that's what that was uh, that that's where I used that particular theme <laughs> This is no fun house. No circus either. One scene in particular that uh, Steve Kyoto was concerned about was the um, big top burger scene where a clown is luring a young child out of the uh, hamburger stand. And uh, what was terrifying about that is that you had a child that was focusing only on the clown. The parents had no idea that the child was seeing this clown. We all, of course, know the clown is a, a terrifying monster. Um, the music there had to be very specific. It had to be almost mesmerizing. So we introduced female voices. Uh, that came out of both the uh, Kurzweil 250 and the, the Fairlight. What that did was give a false sense of security for, it's more or less coming out of the child. There's that innocence that the child truly believes that there is no, no danger, nothing, nothing will be, nothing will, nothing bad will happen if I follow this clown. And so, luckily, we had relief because it was interrupted by mom uh, bringing the kid back to the the table. So we didn't we didn't follow through with that, thankfully. But uh, that was a very good call on Steve's uh, uh, point. He needed to he needed to have something that was mesmerizing and would draw us uh, kind of like to a different plane, because we didn't we didn't want to be overbearing. We didn't want to give away that it was going to be terrifying. Something terrible was going to happen. So a drawn out female choir uh, was the order of the day. Back here, young lady, you're not going anywhere till you finish your food. We used odd instrumentation and tried to treat things, certain things serious and certain things funny. I think the only thing we treated comically was the little puppet show. Because that had to be deceiving. The kids had to think that it was a puppet show and then it got... Uh, and there are certain old school aspects of the score that I think we wanted. We wanted certain things to sound like it was old 50s type of music done with just, uh, you, know, you know, bongos and vibraphones. And I will tell you the equipment that we use. At the time, the really hot sampler was the Kurzweil 250. Um, can, I plug, can I plug that? I don't know if I can. It was the Kurzweil 250 and the Fairlight, which at the time 
had a whopping 400 megabytes of memory with eight megs of RAM, which at the time was considered very fast, and a processor that was just over 100 megahertz. So that was considered hot rod in those days. Uh, so, so we got, from those samplers, we got the acoustic instruments, we got the strings, we got percussion, we got timpani. From everything else, I used a, a very common synthesizer that was used during the day. It was a, a Yamaha DX7. And I had a, uh, a, I had like 12 of them. Uh, they were in modular form though. It wasn't like a big keyboard. It was just just a, a modular uh, sort of thing. So for that end of the, for that spectrum, that's where all the weird popcorn sounds, squeaky sounds that that came from. That uh, that was so I split the palette in half. The the we had the orchestra, the acoustic sounding instruments, and then we had uh, now they call it now we call it electronica. We had all the squeaky, squirrely sounds that kind of lent the uh, sci-fi character, the 50s sci-fi character to the piece.